title of it is Expanding Outcome Measures in Schizophrenia Research, Does RDoC Pose a Threat? Um, so in it, I'm going to look at two significant shifts taking place in the field of psychiatry right now. Um, one more generally, which is the shift to RDoc. So I'll talk more about that, but an offering a new framework for psychiatric research um, out of the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health Research. Um, and then the other shift is particular to schizophrenia research and has to do with the kind of outcome measures that are typically used. Um, and I want to put these two shifts um, up against each other and examine whether they're compatible or in conflict or if we have anything to worry about. Um, so I'm going to start by offering an account of explanation. This is really just taken from the literature and philosophy of science. Um, nothing much hangs on it, but I'm going to use it as a frame to um, explore an analysis of these two different shifts. Um, so I'll present that in a minute, and then I'm going to introduce two kinds of pessimism that I think we can really feel in psychiatry right now. So one I'm calling explanatory pessimism um, and is really present in research, psychiatric research. Um, and I'll argue that this is what's motivated the shift to RDoc, but I think most of you will agree. And then I'm going to look at another kind of clinical pessimism um, specific to schizophrenia research, although arguably it's present in relation to a lot of clinical disorders in psychiatry. Um, but I'm going to examine this pessimism around treatments for schizophrenia and examine another shift that's fallen out of that, which has to do with outcome measures. So I'll unpack that in detail, and then I'll say something about what I think we've gained from the second shift within schizophrenia research. And then I'll return to looking at the two of them in conjunction, so RDoc and outcome measures and ask this question, is schizophrenia research under threat? Um, so yeah, that's what's to come. So here's the account of explanation. It should be really intuitive, especially because you're mostly scientists. So really the idea, this is Jim Woodward, a philosopher of science, and he, he just wants to capture this very intuitive idea that if we want to tell a causal story about something, in the best case, we can manipulate something causally related to that something, and then we can see a change, both in the thing we've manipulated and the phenomenon we're interested in. Um, so of course, certain kinds of scientific practices are uh, struggling more, black holes, evolutionary stories struggle with this, but in ideal forms of science, we can manipulate something. We have an intervention I, which leads to a change in X, leading to X prime. And that change in X prime leads to a change in Y, which is the phenomenon we're interested in, making it Y prime. So you could think of it as a toy model, although it's not widely accepted. Something like if our intervention is an antipsychotic, leads to a change in dopamine, we see a change in schizophrenia. And the disorder is no longer present. So that would be Y prime. And then we would want to say something like, OK, we're confident that X, so dopamine in some way explains why schizophrenia, or at least there's some kind of explanatory link between the two. Um, so this is just something I'm going to use to frame some of what's coming. Um, but again, nothing much hangs on this particular model. I just think it's a useful heuristic. So now I want to introduce these two kinds of pessimism within psychiatry. So the first is this explanatory kind of pessimism um, falling out of the fact that we're just really lacking explanations for a lot of psychiatric disorders. So as Lawrence indicated yesterday, we've seen these enormous waves of hype around neuroscience, around genetics, you know, one after the other. We have a lot of digital computational techniques right now, but they haven't given that much. They haven't been that fruitful. So we haven't been given these biomarkers or genetic pathways that have been promised. And we don't really have a clear understanding of the causes of any psychiatric disorder. So we haven't made enormous advances in the field like we've been promised. Um, on the other hand, in the clinical domain, we also are feeling a big sense of pessimism, I think. Um, and the reason is that we really lack treatments. Compared to the rest of medicine, there's very few effective treatments that work for patients with psychiatric disorders. And we haven't seen big changes in terms of what's available, what's on the market in decades. Um, and the burden of disease is growing, and we're seeing generally poor outcomes. 
sad. So we're, we're in a pessimistic state. Um, but I want to examine how people are responding to these forms of pessimism and how different those responses look in the research domain versus the clinical domain. So first off, in research, in response to this explanatory pessimism, we're seeing a lot of people who've asked the question, what if we've just drawn the boundaries wrong around psychiatric phenomena? So taking this model again, people have been saying, what if we just have the wrong why? Is schizophrenia the right kind of entity to be examining? So a lot of attacks on the DSM, ICD criteria, and saying, look, we see a huge amount of heterogeneity within a particular category here. We see enormous overlap in symptoms across different categories. Um, there's a huge focus on reliability, but not so much on validity. Cause is often ignored or explicitly ignored in the DSM. So a lot of people have been pushing back and saying, in this model, we need to replace why. We need to break it down into something smaller. We need to look at something that's more likely to lead us to causes, explanations, predictions. Um, and it makes sense. I think, you know, if you were interested in finding an explanation for what causes the flu, but your sample included people with the flu, but with also with TB, with HIV, um, you're going to struggle to find what's the common cause because you just have a really heterogeneous sample. So this, I think, has largely motivated the shift to RDoC, where we've seen moving away from something like schizophrenia as a category to these much smaller units of analysis. So instead of schizophrenia, it's broken down into things like agency, auditory perception, motivation, language, identifying things that link to the different symptoms or experiences of people diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, so probably you've already seen this a few times yesterday. Here's the RDoC matrix. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar, so this has been put forward by the National Institute of Mental Health, the largest funder of mental health research that there is. Um, so along the side, we have the different domains or constructs and these map onto the different sort of psych psychological phenomena, not necessarily psychiatric. Um, things like attention, perception, memory that are examined in detail and then examined at all these different levels or units of analysis. So as Lawrence pointed out yesterday, self-report is supposed to cover a lot of territory. Since they've introduced RDoC, they've also added additional dimensions of development and environment, but they've arguably been given a lot less attention. Um, and in funding calls, there's a lot of attention to basic science. So two th important things to note about RDoC, there's a lot to say about it. Um, but two things that are important for my analysis are one, just RDoC's commitment to granularity, so breaking things down into lower levels a commitment to basic science research, to examining psychiatric phenomena at the level of neuroscience, at the level of genetics. And that's built into a lot of the funding calls. Um, and the second thing is this distancing from pathology, so a commitment to dimensionality. So instead of saying, listing symptoms along the side here, like auditory hallucinations, you have something like auditory perception. Um, so it isn't necessarily just the pathological version or the symptom version. Um, it's both that are being considered. And that opens up different avenues for potential research programs, as we'll see. Um, but I want to step away from RDoC and look at this second kind of pessimism that I'm pointing at, in particular in relation to research in schizophrenia. So what's leading to this kind of pessimism. I mean, probably most of you are familiar with these stats, but they're pretty depressing. So recovery rates have hovered around 13% for many decades for people diagnosed with schizophrenia. And recovery here is a functional definition, so returning to school or work or volunteering sort of engagement. Um, but we haven't seen any big changes in that for many decades um, in the global north in particular. So if you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, your life expectancy is 20 years shorter than the rest of the population. So huge mortality rates and concerns here. And then I think importantly today, there's been a lot of concerns related to antipsychotics, which are the primary treatment we have um, that are just growing and growing. So a recent 
meeting at the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, was a panel by a bunch of leaders in schizophrenia research entitled Antipsychotics, Are They Doing More Harm Than Good? And it was packed, like just standing room only. And I think that signifies a field in crisis and really feeling pessimistic about the tools they have at their disposal. Um, so we're seeing research indicating that there's deficits in gray matter when people take antipsychotics for a long time. There's a bit of a debate about whether that's just the natural course of the disorder or it's because of antipsychotics. Um, so I don't want to say either way, but there's a lot of concerns related to that. There's some research suggesting that long-term use leads to higher rates of relapse in the long run, even though it improves in the short run. Um, and then, of course, just looking at what it's like for individuals taking these medications, there's really debilitating side effects that come with antipsychotic. Um, so the older generation came with a lot of extrapyramidal side effects, and there was a lot of excitement when they introduced atypical or second generation side effects or antipsychotics, um, but they come with a lot of metabolic side effects, so weight gain, diabetes. Um, so it's difficult for people, and these are the tools that are being used day to day. So these gaps, these concerns are growing, and I think that's led to a lot of people to question or call, call to light this gap between efficacy and effectiveness. So it isn't that we're not seeing new treatments, so things are passing um, the efficacy test, but then in practice we're not seeing big changes in terms of what's effective for patients. Um, so this leads to the question, well, how is efficacy measured? Um, how does something pass the test to be deemed efficacious, and why doesn't that represent effectiveness? So traditionally in schizophrenia research, these are the most common measures, so the number of hospitalizations, so thinking about how much time one spends and how many times they go to the hospital. Um, this has been called a crude measure. It's an important economic measure, but it doesn't really capture how somebody's doing necessarily. There's a lot of things that influence something like that. Um, time to discontinuation is another common measure. This is just how long until somebody stops the treatment, either of their own accord or on recommendation of their clinician. This has also been called crude, um, but is an important measure for some uses. But most commonly, symptom checklists are thought to capture, you know, what's happening to the illness itself, what's happening to schizophrenia as a clinical entity during treatment. And so those are most commonly used um, and thought to be really informative within research. So here's a couple um, symptom checklists, so BPRS is a common one you can see along the, your left there, just lists different symptoms and asks the clinician to rate how present these are. This is part of PANS, which this is just one page looking at hallucinations, but again, the clinician rates how severely present each of these kinds of hallucinations might be in the patient. Um, so these are really commonly thought to represent something like schizophrenia, and I think that might seem really obvious or intuitive, um, but I'll give reason to call that into question a bit. So increasingly, people have been raising issues with symptom checklists, so pushing back against them. So lots of people say they're of limited clinical relevance, so whether somebody has a reduced score in a symptom checklist doesn't always indicate whether or not they're doing better um, in this larger sense. Some people say they're weighted too heavily towards positive symptoms, so things like hallucinations and delusions, while in schizophrenia there's also cognitive and negative symptoms thought to be part of the disorder. Um, a lot of people have pointed to this important piece, which is that they fail to capture the experience of side effects. So it could be the case that somebody has a reduction in a symptom scale, um, but their side effects are really debilitating, so they don't feel better. In fact, maybe they feel worse. Um, so just in line with that, I just want to read you one quote that I've texted to myself. Um, <laughs> oh, there we are. Okay, so this is um, a quote from Pat Deegan, which maybe some of you have heard of her. Um, she's an activist, but also um, a wide sort of advocate in the psychiatric community. And she was diagnosed with schizophrenia when she was a teenager, and she's written a lot about her own experiences. Um, and she gave me permission to read this in this context. So she says, she's 
talking in the third person about her teenage self in this. She says, I can see the yellow nicotine stained fingers. I can see her shuffled, stiff, drugged walk. She forces herself out of bed at eight in the morning. In a drugged haze, she sits in a chair, the same chair every day. She's smoking cigarettes, cigarette after cigarette. Cigarettes mark the passing of time. Cigarettes are proof that time is still passing and that at least is a relief. From nine to noon, she sits and smokes and stares. Then she has lunch. At one o'clock, she goes back to bed to sleep until three. At three, she returns to the chair and sits and smokes and stares. Then dinner, returns to the chair at six. Finally, it's 8 p.m., the long-awaited hour, the time to go back to bed and collapse into dr a drugged and dreamless sleep. This same scene unfolds the next day and next day and next day until the months pass by in numbing succession, marked only by the next cigarette and the next. So this is a, you know, particularly sort of devastating depiction, but the important thing to take away from that is that according to a symptom checklist, Pat Deegan might be a success story in that case. So she certainly doesn't have positive symptoms anymore. She's not living with a quality of life, arguably. She certainly doesn't remember that time of her life fondly. Um, but there's something missing from these checklists. Um, and so I think as a result of experiences like this, we've seen huge demands from patient groups to expand the kinds of outcome measures used in schizophrenia research. And we see this in other domains of health research as well. Um, but in schizophrenia research in particular, there's been a big push towards using what, what are considered to be more meaningful outcome measures. So recovery is a term that's often, you know, captures a particular movement in line with this, but there's also consumer survivor ex-patient groups or um, patient run organizations, all of which are different, but a lot of them agree in this push towards using different kinds of outcome measures. So recovery, this term that captures a lot of this has been defined as a deeply personal, unique process of changing one's attitudes, values, feelings, goals, skills, and or roles. A way of living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even with limitations caused by illness. Um, so this definition, I think, represents what a lot of people in these patient groups have argued needs to be part of this, the thing being researched or needs to be part of the story about what gets deemed efficacious, that it needs to be closer to something like this, which is much broader than merely the reduction of symptoms. It's a, it's a really significant shift. Um, and so I want to explore what's happened as we've seen this shift happen in some domains of schizophrenia research um, and how it's transformed how we think about what schizophrenia is. Um, so in response to this, I think we've seen this other kinds of shift, this other worry, and it, it resembles but looks different than the other shift we examined before. So instead of asking the question of, you know, are we drawing the boundaries wrong around something like schizophrenia, it says, are we just saying that something's efficacious in the wrong cases? Are we using too narrow of a measure of efficacy, and do we need to use a broader one? Um, so instead of the why, it's suddenly the why prime that comes under focus in this shift. And they're moving in really different directions in interesting ways, these two shifts, I think. Um, so instead of looking at a reduction as, in symptoms as representative of something like efficacy, um, this movement is pushed towards looking at something like a quality of life has been attained, which is a pretty different kind of claim or a different kind of state of being. Um, but of course, that's the whole point. Um, so this is Anne Mortimer acknowledging the shift, just so you believe me that it's happening, um, in some pockets of research. I don't want to say this has been taken up very widely. Um, but so she says, the value of symptom item or even syndrome score totals per se is increasingly questioned in the determination of outcome status. A more patient-centered definition of outcome Stressing personal and social function is often viewed as more practical than the presence or absence of esoteric phenomena, symptoms, which may have little bearing on subjective experience or uptake of healthcare. Um, so this is just an acknowledgement of this larger 
um, look at symptom checklist as being potentially problematic measures. Um, and what we've seen is a lot of research that tries to move away from symptom checklists and look at something larger like quality of life. So here's a couple scales that might be representative of this larger move. So we've got a quality of life scale for schizophrenia patients. This is a really old scale from the WHO. But you can see it's got things like you know, social network, social activity, um, whether one's working, functioning, work satisfaction, sense of purpose, it's a lot bigger. This is a recovery school, score or scale that's more recent. Um, the patient fills it out, they, they answer, they rate statements like, I have at least one close mutual give and take relationship. I'm involved in meaningful productive activities. My symptoms are under control. So symptoms are there, but they're playing a much smaller role than they were before. Um, so this is a really big difference from the other scales. Um, and in a sense, they're, they're trying to make similar claims at the end of the day by using these same scales. Um, so I want to raise this question of, well, what does this other shift bring into view? What do we see when we start replacing symptom checklists with something like quality of life scales? Um, and I just want to acknowledge that it's a big mess, the literature, so I dug into it for a while, but there's no consensus about sort of what are the most appropriate scales, which ones should be used. Um, in quality of life, I'm grouping together a lot of different kinds of things, so functional scales or quality of life subjective or objective, which look pretty different, um, patient reported outcomes, and a lot of these are used interchangeably in the literature. Um, so I'm going to draw out some models that are either implicitly or explicitly identified in this literature, but I don't want to say that I'm evaluating them or saying, you know, one's better than the other. It's just to show um, how we've suddenly seen a really different picture of what's the causal story, both behind schizophrenia, but more importantly, behind how to get to something like quality of life in schizophrenia. Um, so I'm going to introduce four different models that I think fall out of this literature, um, but there certainly could be more. Some of them are compatible and some of them are incompatible, as you'll see. So one of them is um, symptom reduction is a necessary step on the way to having a quality of life in schizophrenia, um, and it ought to be attained first, but you're going to have to do more work later. So this is maybe the sort of intuitive one that you're maybe familiar with, maybe we we typically think this, so um, this model has found support in the Remission and Schizophrenia Working Group led by Nancy Andreas, and so these are leaders in the field saying, look, first thing we've got to do, get rid of the symptoms, and then we can work towards a quality of life by offering additional support, looking a variety of different ways. Um, so this is Burns says, most of the softer outcome measures such as quality of life, social functioning, personal well-being are only of relevance in situations where symptom control is relatively well achieved. Um, so there is an association between quality of life and symptom reduction. Um, there is quite a few studies that suggest there isn't an association and quite a few that suggest that there is. A recent meta-analysis suggests there's a very small one. Um, so it seems like there is, and that provides evidence for this kind of model, that it might be a step you need to take on the way. Um, but the working group is largely just leaders in the field out of consensus saying, we think this is what you've got to do in order to get there. Um, another model that looks a bit different is, has to do with sort of a missing mediator, that if we want to get to quality of life in people with schizophrenia, what we really need to do is identify a really important piece of the puzzle that's often missing. So different people offer different things. Grant and Aaron Beck maybe unexpectedly suggest our findings are consistent with the hypothesis that defeatist beliefs are a mediating variable between cognitive impairment, negative symptomology, and poor functioning in schizophrenia. So the mediator here is defeatist beliefs. Um, but a lot of people suggest that mood or emotion is really the important factor here. So emotion could be a mediating factor. Um, evidence for this often has to do with quality of life scales being very, very strongly linked to depression or subjective mood symptoms, which some people have said, well, that's just tautological. Of course, you know, quality of life is going to be representative of something like depression. Um, but others insist that this is what we 
need to pay attention to. And it has different kinds of implications for what intervention for schizophrenia should look like. So we really should be focusing our energy on these components, be they mood or defeatist beliefs, in order to help people feel better. So another model just says, look, there's tons of different causal pathways. They aren't necessarily connected. Um, and we need to work towards supporting someone on all of those pathways. Um, if they're going to attain something like quality of life. So you might think hope, goal attainment, family support, as well as symptom reduction are all going to be important in helping someone achieve a quality of life. Um, but they're not necessarily causally related to each other that we should approach them independently. Um, so this is reflective of Strauss and Carpenter back in the 70s saying outcome isn't a single process, but is comprised of several semi-independent processes. Um, and more recently, Lieberman saying operational criteria for recovery should include measures of symptoms, involvement in school, living status, financial circumstances, social support. So we should measure all these things independently and provide support along all of these different measures. Um, so the last model is, I think, the most in conflict with our current way of thinking about schizophrenia. And the last one proposes that you can have quality of life without symptom reduction. So it's not necessary um, in order to achieve something like a quality of life. And this pushes against um, a lot of current research in the domain. So a lot of people who are within sort of the recovery movement or service user groups champion this kind of view um, and insist that one can live with symptoms in a healthy and productive way, that it isn't symptoms that are necessarily um, the most important predictor of whether they're doing well. So when surveyed, 14% of service users saw recovery as something that meant actually being free from symptoms. Um, we see movements like the Hearing Voices Network, the Icarus Project, that all suggest there's something good about symptoms as long as they're managed appropriately and as long as people can find um, a positive way to live with them. So here's Pat Deegan again, who I read the quote from earlier. She says, one of the biggest things I've had to accept is that recovery is not the same thing as being cured. After 23 years of living with this thing, it still hasn't gone away. So I figure I'm never going to get cured, but I can be in recovery. Um, so this is her affirming this view that you, know, you don't need symptom reduction in order to achieve something like quality of life. We also see research, the Vermont Longitudinal Study, um, found a lot of people who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, this is 30 years on, um, they found that there were subjects in the sample who were considered to be functioning well, who would probably score high on these quality of life kinds of measures, um, had good family relationships and friends, but still had delusions or hallucinations. So this kind of research is propped up by those supporting this model. Um, so what can we take away from this? So some of these can fit together. Um, it's possible that the last one and the second one about mood as a mediate, about a missing mediator could fit together, but of course, we can't have both the first and the last. So it can't be that you need symptom reduction in order to get to quality of life, and you don't need symptom reduction. Um, so some of them are in conflict with each other. Um, I think it's just too early to say which of these is going to be borne out. And of course, it might be the case that one's true for one person or one condition or subset of schizophrenia patients, and another is true for others. Um, so I don't want to draw any conclusions in terms of evaluating these, um, but I just want to use them to show this really different picture that's come out of this body of research related to quality of life in schizophrenia. Um, and I think it's led to some other benefits as well. So some of the benefits, I think we've gained a larger understanding of schizophrenia. So if we look beyond just symptoms, suddenly we don't see just the list of symptoms, but we see things like loneliness, poverty, stigma as part of the picture and part of what needs to be a target of intervention as well, which looks different. Um, and we've also seen a lot of new treatments and interventions that look at this research and build on this research. So a lot of the new um, programs related to first episode psychosis, I think, lean heavily on this kind of research. They step away from just looking at symptoms and really work towards offering people comprehensive support um, in either keeping them in school or work, offering family education or therapy. So they're a lot more sort of holistic in that sense. So we're seeing a movement away from that. 
There's also been this big push um, in health research more broadly, but I think particularly in psychiatry towards participation, um, towards involving people with lived experience in research, um, which has looked good and bad in different cases. Um, but I think it's opened up a different kind of conversation. I think we have a newfound kind of optimism regarding the disorder. So Pat Deegan talks about getting diagnosed and being told you'll never work again. This is a life sentence. You know, I think it had a different kind of tone then as now I think people who receive a diagnosis of schizophrenia, it's not so dire, um, at least in particular settings where they are taking up this kind of research. Um, and I think finally, the recognition of the ubiquity of these needs. So if we look at that recovery scale I put up earlier, you know, things like I'm engaged in meaningful activity. I have people in my life who care about me. I mean, everyone can relate to that. So there's sort of a dampening of the boundaries between us and them because the quality of life looks really similar for almost everyone about what contributes to those things. And the focus isn't just on the symptoms. Um, but it leads to a radically different picture of what is schizophrenia and what do we need to treat and what should we be investigating. Um, so I want to go back to looking at the first shift I introduced, the one towards RDOC, and look at these two in conjunction and ask whether or not they're in tension. Um, so I want to suggest some reasons we might think, yes, they're in tension, but also some they might not be. They might be more compatible than you'd expect. So I think on the one hand, is RDOC a threat? Um, I think on the face of it, it might seem like it is a threat to the gains we've had in this shift away from narrow outcome measures in schizophrenia research um, because of its explicit commitment to basic science, to granularity. Um, you might think, well, outcome measures are just inevitably going to move in the opposite direction. They're going to be more narrow. There's no space for things like hope and um, agency and empowerment when you're looking at something so narrow as, you know, one's experience with auditory perception or agency, you might just think they're too tiny, the features that we're interested in within RDOC. Um, so as Lawrence has written, the RDOC framework would seem to prefer studies that are experience distant. So it just might be that one's moving to a much larger level, the second shift, but RDOC's moving to a much lower level and they might not fit together. There's also no explicit place for the voices of patient groups. And arguably, this shift is in part the result of patients pushing for these more meaningful outcome measures. Um, so there won't be space built into these sort of lower level science projects for those kinds of insights. Understandably, the more basic, the more technical scientific enterprises, the less likely it will be participatory. I think this makes sense. It's less accessible. It's often further from the moment where it's going to be translated into something like an intervention, so it's not clear what the role of patients ought to be. Um, but it's an inevitable consequence of moving to that lower level. So some objections here um, that I'm happy to talk about. So what if RDOC works, you might say, who cares? Like, if, if RDOC is successful, then none of this really matters. We don't need the gains from the second shift. Um, I just think, I guess the pessimism still holds me here. Um, we haven't seen those fruits of RDOC just yet, and I don't know how quickly coming they will be. Um, so it seems important to keep those benefits while also moving towards these new projects that RDOC opens up. Um, you might also say, well, RDOC's not meant to guide treatment. It's only supposed to be used in the research domain, so it's not really relevant to cases like this. This research can still keep going and not be affected. But of course, research and clinical practice are constantly informing each other, and they ought to be informing each other. So if it's the case that all the research takes place at this lower level, then inevitably the interventions are going to fall out of that and are going to focus on particular kinds of things that may or may not be permitted in the RDOC paradigm. So I think there is going to be a lot of intersection between the two. Um, so it's inevitable that they're going to speak to each other. So we might think RDOC is a threat, but I think we might also think RDOC is an ally of sorts with this 
second shift that I've unpacked here. And I think the reason for that is RDOC's lack of pathological boundaries. So the fact that it's not committed at the outset to there being a particular line between that which is a symptom and that which isn't, or that which is a disorder or pathological and that which isn't. Um, so looking at some of the research utilizing RDOC and looking at auditory hallucinations, so this is Judith Ford's group in San Francisco. Um, she talks about using RDOC's dimensional approach um, and how it encourages investigators to think beyond between group patients versus controls, research designs, and instead design studies that allow analysis of the full range of a dimension of interest. So including clinical as well as non-clinical groups and remaining agnostic with regards to diagnostic, diagnosis. So this is something that we get out of RDOC that we didn't have previously in models like DSM. And what they found was looking at a whole bunch of people who experience auditory hallucinations, either clinical or not clinical, that what was really salient in terms of predicting whether someone was in the clinical group or not was that they felt a lack of control in relation to those auditory hallucinations and there was a negative valence to those hallucinations. Um, but that lots of people were also experiencing auditory hallucinations that they had control over and they also had a positive relationship with and it wasn't bothering them. Um, so this is, I think, really interesting in that this reflects a lot of I think it fits particularly well with the second and fourth model in that it suggests something like, well, maybe what's really important here is something like the negative valence or the control, and those are mediating the experience of whether one's having a quality of life while also having these symptoms. It also supports the model that says, well, maybe hallucinations can be non-pathological. So this is living with symptoms in a healthy way, which some of this population was, but some really wasn't. So some people needed support, but it might not be in just reducing the symptoms, but changing the experience or the valence or control in relation to the symptoms. Um, so I think it, this lack of pathological boundaries we see with RDOC, this dimensionality actually opens up a lot of space for thinking through in similar ways as we've seen in the second shift. Um, and I think what that really means is this sort of <laughs> big statement of, is this just cracking open the normative foundations of psychiatry? I think we're at a moment where very interestingly, this shift we're seeing in response to explanatory pessimism in the research domain is saying, look, we don't like these boundaries that we've drawn between what's good and what's bad, what's pathological and what's not. And similarly, in this other really different push from patient groups, we're seeing a very similar assertion. We don't like these boundaries that have been drawn between what's good and what's bad, what's pathological and what's not. So there is this strange coherence between the two and that they're both saying, look, let's reshape the lines we've drawn between these different categories. So it might be time to rethink what's deemed pathological. Um, these are takeaways, mostly just saying what I just said. Um, so I think there's been benefits from this second shift towards wider outcome measures. Um, funding structures, patient groups play a significant role in shaping knowledge in psychiatry. These are both really different influences, but they both play a role, either through redefining phenomena, introducing new standards of measurement. Um, RDOC's commitment to basic science may be a threat to recent gains in schizophrenia research in terms of this granularity, but the lack of diagnostic boundaries might actually align with the second shift, um, and they both point towards the potential for rethinking the normative assumptions underlying psychiatry. So I wanted to flag a couple more ethics -y projects that are falling out of this. Um, so right now I'm thinking about um, whether there is some sort of epistemic claim that comes with lived experience to have some kind of say in psychiatric research. So there is this huge democratization of health research going on and a lot of funders and journals and people are taking it up. So I'm interested in exploring, you know, what are the claims underlying this? And in particular, unpacking what I see as two different threads underlying that shift in psychiatry in particular. So there's a lot of people arguing there is a right for patients to be involved because of some sort of claim, because of past abuses, because of 
the fact that it's about them, these sort of ethical reasons. And then there's a lot of epistemic reasons in another category, I think, saying, look, we have a special kind of insight. There's a kind of expertise that comes with lived experience. Um, so I'm interested in looking at those different kinds of claims and um, thinking about what falls out of them. So what should involvement look like? Because we've seen it look, you know, end in very, um, everyone's upset instances of tokenism, or there's a lot of role confusion. Um, so thinking about how can we best move through this democratization process in a way that's actually meaningful um, and not just sort of having someone at the table with X condition because they had to. Um, so I'm interested in that and then also just how understandings of wellness, quality of life, differ between individuals who've experienced psychosis and their family members, because they often have different ideas about what that looks like too. Um, so that's just a flag for the Q&A.